It's the Stokes way, and there'll be more tomorrow, 10 o'clock. Join the team for that. But right now, here on 5 Sports Extra, it's time we get off to Canada because it's 5 Live Formula 1. It's free practice, two of the Canadian Grand Prix. Let's cross the team. That's a little bit. And then they'll run the last hour as a standard P2 session, which will be another bit of setup work, followed by the qualifying simulation run, followed by a race simulation run, which normally in the final sort of 30 or perhaps 40 minutes of the session. It, I, I can't be absolutely sure about that because every team will have their own different approach, but that's what I would expect. Yeah, apologies, we didn't introduce you. I know that's Andrew, the... that's a, for, <laughs> for a man that needs no introduction, Andrew Benson um, coming with us with some facts. Uh, it's my own fault because I was busy tapping away and I think Harry was aware of that. And uh, there's a story coming um, that maybe we'll be able to talk about before the end of the session, hopefully. Oh, what a tease! What a tease! Uh, that was, of course, the voice of the uh, BBC's chief F1 writer, Andrew Benson. Uh, my name is Harry Benjamin. We've got Rosanna Tennant on the ground for us, and it is Oliver Askew, the American racing driver, who joined us for the first time as well, isn't it? And uh, uh, for uh, the BBC's coverage and uh, your first Formula One commentary as well. Uh, for those who perhaps don't know much about you, Oliver, as Max Verstappen uh, comes round uh, through the uh, chicane, dices with the wall of champions and goes P2. Uh, that's quickly displaced to third as Sergio Perez goes up into second. They're both on the soft tyre. Leclerc currently fastest in the Ferrari 116.5 on the medium compounded tyre. Um, who are you? What do you do? I'm an American racing driver, <laughs> as you can hear by my accent. Born and what, raised. Is that what in, Wikipedia uh, says? Yeah. Born and raised in, uh, in Florida. So, yeah. Went through the road to Indy ladder system, raced Indy car for, for a couple of years, and am taking a year off, not by choice, uh, and looking to get back into motorsport hopefully next year. So ran in, in Formula E last year with Andretti Autosport, Avalanche Andretti. Uh, thor thoroughly enjoyed that experience, and uh, yeah, now I'm here in the booth with you guys. No place I would rather be. Quite right, quite right too. Well said. Uh, and of course, Andretti, a name we might well see you in Formula One in a few years' time. Uh, watch this space. But, uh, uh, well, who's out on track at the moment? Pretty much everybody, with the exception of the Williams driver of Alexander Albon. The Williams are running some upgrades this weekend, and they are all on Alex Albon's car. Uh, so he's not come out of the pits just yet. Everybody else has, and everybody else has indeed set lap time so far. The fastest at the moment being Charles Leclerc with a 116.5. The Ma uh, the Haas of Kevin Magnussen swoops down into turn one, having just set uh, his fastest time so far. He goes sick uh, on a weekend where uh, Haas team principal Gunther Steiner has been uh, mentioning that he's quite happy with his driver duo lineup of uh, Magnussen and Nico Hulkenberg. Uh, probably going to stay around for next year, but not going to tell us when that announcement will be. Where would the fun in that be? What you're hearing is Fernando Alonso in the Aston Martin who comes across the line, was momentarily fast. It's been displaced by Valtteri Bottas. But we mentioned the upgrades on the Aston Martin, Oliver, right at the top of the show. Uh, how important is that to come for this weekend for Aston Martin after Spain, where Mercedes clearly took a level up with their upgrades? Yeah, certainly. And Aston Martin has shown this year that uh, I'd say they're the, the only team to really put it to Red Bull Racing. So um, certainly that team, Red Bull Racing, having a peek over their shoulder this weekend to really gauge how big of a step those upgrades will be for, for Aston Martin. As we see a couple of cars here go through the final chicane. Um, I wanted to mention that has to be one of the most high precision corners on the calendar. Like it lo just looks so difficult. And if you, if you put an inch wrong, um, yeah, that's what they call it, the Wall of Champions. What did we say yesterday? Shunt chicane? Shunt chicane, that's what you're calling it. I like it. it. <laughs> <laughs> the Wall of Champions, the, uh, the final chicane, uh, which uh, has seen, well, spoiler alert, so many champions find the wall, one of which is coming through that chicane right now. Fernando Alonso in the Aston Martin uh, makes it nice and cleanly through, crosses the line. Alonso goes second fastest, so he doesn't join just yet. The likes of Damon Hill, Michael Schumacher, Jensen Button and Sebastian Vettel. Do you know what? I'm not sure Alonso has crashed at the Wall of Champions. I think he might be one of the few champions who hasn't. Has avoided it. He has crashed in Canada. In fact, he lost the race win here in 2005 or six. I can't remember. To his teammate, Jarrett would be far... You know, I don't know. To, to, anyway, he lost the race win in one of those two years at Renault. But I think he crashed somewhere else. Here's Verstappen's radio. These are a tough. Understood. 
Max Verstappen complaining about downshifts. Anyone who regularly watches Formula 1 will know that that is a common occurrence, which doesn't seem to have any <laughs> effect on his ability to win every single race. Gives us a slight bit of hope. Um, if if anyone can remember down. whether Fernando Alonso, by the way, anyone who's listening, did crash at the Wall of Champions, then please let me know, because I, I can't remember it. And I, I want to knock on wood really quick because I don't want to give the commentator's curse to Fernando Alonso and watch him put it in the wall now. Fair point, that, fair point. We yeah. don't want this to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Um, hashtag BBCF1, do get in touch uh, if you so please. And also the email is f1 at bbc.co.uk. Jack has asked for a time check. Uh, so I will give you another one for those that missed it right at the start. Uh, at the moment, we are in free practice too with an hour and 21 and 22. 21, 20. 19 seconds left on the clock for this free practice two session, which has been extended by 30 minutes due to the, uh, well, lack of running from free practice one. A red flag came out initially for Pierre Gasly's Alpine with uh, gearbox issues, and then it stayed out for the majority and the entirety of the rest of the session because of a CCTV failure around the circuit. But the uh, uh, the FIA working alongside the, uh, the circuit here have got that back up and running, which is brilliant to see, and we are back out running, as is Alex Albon, who comes out with this upgraded Williams. Uh, and Williams have been, uh, James Vowles, the team principal, has been talking a lot in the build-up to this weekend as well. We spoke about it in free practice one, saying coming from Mercedes, you can just see from Williams, he's literally gone from the top to the bottom of the grid and that transition and seeing, you know, what kind of facilities they're working with, 20 years out of date. Uh, it's a lot of work to do for, for this team. But do you think, uh, Oliver, with a, with a driver lineup like Albon and, and of course Logan Sargent, uh, who's had a bit of a tough rookie season so far, do you think that's, that's a good dynamic to try and push a team like this forward? Well, in my mind, there's no better hire than from someone who had previously worked at, at a top team um, because he, he knows what success looks like and what it takes to make it there. So uh, he can clearly pick out, you know, what Williams can do better can do better what they're what they're doing right and uh, certainly with two uh, drivers who yeah one is a rookie one is is fairly new to formula one well he's got some decent experience now over the past couple of years and, and uh, alex alban uh, as we see esteban Ocon's on board now his visor camera oh that's traffic there yeah it was right in the middle there yeah copy that that's the ferrari in front of him uh, he didn't didn't know that he was there certainly would have been a penalty if this were a qualifying session yeah that was coming uh, into turn six uh, the left hand which brings you out through seven onto uh, that mini straight before you get through the chicane of eight and nine and then you're onto the approach of the hairpin so uh, Esteban Ocon not happy with that being impeded by the Ferrari but it's not qualifying so no dramas as yet uh, Stappen is currently fastest at 1.53. He's on the soft tie, but it's Sainz and Leclerc, second and third, uh, about one and a half tenths back uh, on the medium compound tyre. Perez, Piastri, Norris, the top six, Gasly, Alonso, Ocon, Bottas, the top ten, Stroll, Magnussen, Sergeant Sonoda, Hulkenberg, the top 15, De Vries, Joe, Albon, Hamilton, and George Russell, currently down in 19th and 20th. Uh, so time to find for those. Sergio Perez puts his name to the top of the timing screens, a 1.15.2. And Oli Sergio Perez looked like he started the season so well. Gave us perhaps a bit of hope that he would really be able to challenge Max Verstappen because nobody else is going to challenge Verstappen in that Red Bull. So all eyes, of course, naturally drawn to his teammate Sergio Perez and, and really took it to him. You know, a win, a win in Saudi Arabia, a win in Baku and was there or thereabouts. But it seems to have fallen away over the last couple of races. There's talk of can he handle the pressure? Is he overdriving this car? simply can't match the pace of, of someone like Verstappen. But now, team principal Christian Horner has said, actually, because the gap is so large now at 53 points, pressure's kind of off Perez. Would you agree with that? I, I, for Sergio Perez, I, I, in my mind, there was never any pressure. I mean, he's, he's a veteran of the sport. He's in a top team. Uh, he should be enjoying his time, living in the moment. And um, I, I would say on paper, he can sometimes match Ma Max on on a bad day that Max has, which is very rare. He can he can then uh, best uh, the number one driver in the team. Uh, but yeah, we'll see this weekend. He seems to be a street course specialist, and, and this this has the the characteristic of a street course. Here's Verstappen. Uh, but uh, straight, can I cool the tires a bit more? I feel like they're running too hot. Uh, yep. 
So that's Verstappen talking about Tyro, which is a bit of a running theme with Pirelli, uh, it has to be said. Uh, and the drivers talk about it as one of the reasons they can't overtake as easily this year as before. Um, on the subject of Perez, I actually asked Max Verstappen about that yesterday, Oliver, and um, uh, I, it looked to many people as if what was happening was he got sort of almost carried away with the fact that he'd won two races and, Max, and Verstappen had won two races and the idea of a title challenge. Everyone was asking him about the title challenge and can he sustain it for the whole season? But really, I think everyone in Formula One never thought he could. Um, so it looked a little bit like he was sort of reaching for something that wasn't possible, i.e. being a consistent challenge to Verstappen. So I put that point to Verstappen yesterday and he said, I find it difficult to comment because I don't know what's going on in his head, but I always learn from a young age it's better to just focus on yourself and to try to do the best you can because all the other things are out of your control. There's no point to try and focus on that. That's how I approach it. In, some, in a season, you'll always have some races not going to plan, but it's very important to focus on the job and work with the engineers. So I think that's basically him saying yes in a, in a roundabout way. Yeah, it's certainly one of the most important lessons that... Uh, racing drivers learn over their careers and not just racing drivers but but other sportsmen and, and athletes is just to always focus on on what's in your control and uh, yeah things will work out afterwards this is the sound of Carlos Sainz in the Ferrari into the braking zone of turn 10 the hairpin full lock 180 degrees second gear quarter and then foot on the throttle all the way back the long back straight which leads you all the way to the final chicane runs parallel to the olympic basin which is this huge rectangular river essentially created for the rowing and the canoeing in montreal that uh, hosted the 1976 summer olympics here through the 13 and 14 chicane you keep going straight if you're going into the pit lane signs carries on down the main straight and across the line and goes up into second with a 114 nine uh, over a tenth back from max verstappen who is currently fastest with an hour and 14 left to go it's more like a lake or a pond than a river, yeah, sorry, isn't a river it? Wasn't, wasn't, it's a big river. <laughs> yeah. It is a lake. It's a long, rectangular, contained lake, yeah. If, yeah. We're, if we're being really uh, decisive, alongside which is the car parking for the media, but we won't go into that um, again. Do you know what? When you're on those banks, did you? when you were driving down the bank yesterday, <laughs> yeah. off the bank, did you think, am I going to end up in the, in the river, lake, pond, boating, whatever? Um, it did cross my mind. It was a very steep verge that we had to get down, but uh, producer Paddy assured me if everything, if anything went wrong, he would he would break us all out uh, and uh, we'd all we'd all be fine. So, and we got a decent four by four. Yeah, looking at a replay here of Carlos Sainz going through the Wall of Champions chicane. That was some serious commitment by him, um, taking a lot of curb in, in the in the first portion and. All I believe all four tires were off the ground for a split second, uh, and then he gathered it up for for the exit. Um, always important in a chicane like that, with with two apexes, um, with with followed by a long straightaway to sacrifice the first apex and the first minimum speed portion to then set the car up to accelerate down into uh, the start finish straight. And Oliver, I think we might be about to see his teammate Charles Leclerc do something similar. He's on. He's just completed the first sector of his lap. He's been into the pits. Presumably made some changes to the car, come out on the same set of soft tyres. He's gone purple, which is fastest of all in the first sector. Uh, as you were talking about, uh, science going through the final chicane, Leclerc was just going through the uh, first chicane, the turns three and four, which I think is one of my favourite corners on the circuit with the wall on the outside. And Leclerc's coming down the straight towards that final chicane now. The balance of this car, this onboard of Charles Leclerc, Leclerc looks really solid. Um, it's doing everything that he's asking it to. No big understeer, oversteer moments. Here he goes through the final chicane. Wall of Champions doesn't take as much initial curve as, as Carlos. So having to run a tighter, ra tighter radius through the two. And he goes to P1. He certainly does. Leclerc then eases off the throttle and is a tenth and a half up on Verstappen. Then it signs Gasly and Perez, the top five for the top three runners, all on the soft compound of tyre. And uh, the reserve driver, Antonio Giovinazzi, looks on now. A Le Mans 24, 24 winner. Well, you beat me to it. Now a 24 hour Le Mans winner watching on from the pit wall. Uh, Charles Leclerc was out there in Le Mans as uh, Ferrari 
won the race after, uh, well, for the first time in over 50 years. So it was a, a brilliant feat uh, from Ferrari and uh, Leclerc saying that, well, I would quite like to maybe try Le Mans at, at some stage in my career. So uh, watch out for that maybe, but he's still, I think, got quite a, a bit that he wants to achieve in Formula One. Uh, but actually, this is a really crucial weekend for Leclerc because off the back of a pretty horrendous Spanish Grand Prix, started 19th, that became the pit lane because he lost so much time in the qualifying because it, it, he was complaining the rear end of that Ferrari was, was, was not happy. It was costing him so much time. The Ferrari mechanics tried a, a, a basically a, a turn it on, turn it off and on again, a reset. They changed everything at the back of that Ferrari and it still didn't really do anything for the race. Carlos Sainz struggled in the race as well, but he did manage to finish uh, in the top five. So, Andrew, actually, this is a, a good point. Well, what do we learn from that? Because they clearly sent that back to Maranello in between to try and analyze something. Have they got a clear-cut answer? They haven't. Uh, Leclerc was talking about that yesterday. I have to say, when they did that uh, over Saturday night into Sunday morning in Barcelona, I did think it was a slightly odd thing to do. I mean, I, it was a bit like, felt a bit like that thing where they changed the chassis of a car, of a driver who's struggling, uh, just, in, just to give him something to sort of, to, to, to hang on to, or maybe some, some sort of psychological shift. Um, but for me, if you haven't, I mean, I'm not an engineer in a Formula 1 team, so what do I know? But to me, just changing the back of the car, swap, swapping it out and putting it back in in exactly the same settings as it had before, if you've got a problem with like, why would it? Why would it make a difference? And um, they've, Leclerc was saying yesterday that they, they've thoroughly investigated that car back at the factory in Italy, in the gap between uh, Spain and coming to Canada, and they've not found anything that they that, that on it that can explain his struggles. And they were huge struggles. You know, Charles Leclerc is one of the fastest, if not arguably the fastest, driver in Formula One over one lap, and he qualified 19th. Uh, in the in the second fastest car over one lap of the season, so something was obviously massively out of line. Bizarrely, here we are, half an hour nearly into uh, 20 minutes actually into what is effectively the first practice session in Canada, and Leclerc looks completely at home in that car at the moment, setting fastest lap after fastest lap. His teammate Carlos Sainz had just gone to the top of the timing sheet, so it looks like Leclerc's about to beat him, Oliver. Yeah, and Carlos Sainz um, really took it to Max Verstappen last year, finishing in, in P2. And yes, Charles Leclerc goes purple in Sector 1, personal best in Sector 2. And uh, yeah, he does like made a mistake though. in the final yeah, sector final there, doesn't sector. it? Yeah. Uh, about two tenths off uh, with that mistake in the final sector for Charles Leclerc. So Sainz tops the session at the moment, 1.14.1, two tenths uh, in front of Leclerc, Verstappen, Gasly, Perez, the top five. Albon up in sixth from the soft compound attire. Norris, Bottas, Ocon, Piastri, the top ten. Magnussen, Alonso, Joe, Sonoda, Stroll, the top 15. Hulkenberg, Sergeant, De Vries, and Hamilton and Russell to 19th and 20th, but they're both on the medium compound attire. They've done 16 laps apiece. So uh, running uh, with their long runs, uh, I think, first out the box by the seams of, uh, by, the, by the looks of it at least not going for fast laps at the moment yeah I just wanted to say something about Mercedes uh, Harry um, I wouldn't be quite so confident as saying that they definitely made a step forward uh, in Barcelona they did make a step forward in terms of it was their best performance of the year 100% and Hamilton was saying yesterday how they feel like they've got their North Star now and they're going in the right direction with the car philosophy but the team themselves are being a lot more cautious um, they're very aware of the fact that Barcelona last year was also a track where they performed relatively strongly. It was one of their strongest races of the year. Certainly, it was their strongest race in the first half of the year. Um, and then they came to Canada and the car was terrible again. So they're, they're very much not jumping to the conclusion yet that they've definitely made a step forward and they're, they're wanting to get a bit of a judgment over the next couple of races, especially here. Um, and Austria, which is next time out. Silverstone, by the way, um, is another track where Mercedes did go really well last year. Um, so they would expect that one to be a strong point again. But they, 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 they would, the, the jury's still out, I think, on that Mercedes upgrade for now. 
that I wasn't committing that to they're going to take no, on no, Red Bull. No, it's not Bull, a criticism. But... <laughs> just, wanted to, just a bit of clarification. No, absolutely. I think because uh, you were, you were, It was true. They, well, they had made a step forward yeah. and they did make their best performance of the year but why is the question quite right quite right uh, the voice of reason uh, Andrew Benson the BBC's chief F1 writer there uh, Yuki Tsunoda in the Alpha Tower he's just finishing off a lap what's it going to be for the Japanese racing finds a little bit of time but we saw him coming through I think it was turn uh, through three and four and uh, absolutely clouted the right hand side as he came down off the curb, uh, sparks flying up from, from the front wing. No damage, uh, but certainly pushing in that early part of the lap. Yeah, I, I want to mention, um, as we see a replay of here, this is exactly what I, what I want to talk about, um, using absolutely every inch of the track and then some. And he needs to be careful because there were multiple moments on this lap where he turned into the apex from the outside with half of the tire on the outside grass. And uh, it, it's, it, it's easily done. Um, when these drivers are looking into the apex, they're not looking, you know, to the outside of the car. And um, these days, the Formula One cars are, are very wide and big. And on a small track like this, with small margins, um, he needs to be careful. And that was, yeah, going through three and four. Easy for us to say. In it the is commentary easy for us to say. Very easy. Uh, but going through the scene where, uh, well, 2019, uh, it was uh, Sebastian Vettel leading the race and Lewis Hamilton chasing him down and Vettel losing control of his Ferrari, going off onto the grass, rejoining, and uh, was seen to have rejoined in not a very good manner, given a time penalty, lost the race, the removal of the Parc Ferme 1 and 2, or the swap around of it by Vettel. Uh, a, a classic race, uh, and the reason this weekend uh, why Oliver Askew bought me breakfast because uh, he thought it was at turns eight and nine instead. So uh, we finally got that one in. Leclerc fastest now, crosses the line, a 1.14.0. So found that time at the end uh, ahead of signs. Only about a tenth between the two Ferraris, though. Uh, you just heard momentarily the sound of Fernando Alonso in the Aston Martin, who makes his way through turns three and four. He takes a little bit of curve, but it's not as much as Sonoda. There are no sparks flying from the front wing of that Aston Martin, running new upgrades this weekend, uh, particularly on the side, or on the side pods, and uh, going into the floor as well. Uh, upgrades being pushed on by Fernando Alonso uh, in his uh, goals of trying to keep up with the development race that is uh, developing throughout the course of this season. Alonso getting a little bit hairy, approaching it through turns eight and nine. The fast right left hand of Chicane, which then leads you down into the Chicane. Lost quite a bit of time in that middle sector. He's absolutely getting the most <laughs> out of this Aston Martin. And uh, yeah, Alonso sitting 13th, Stroll 14th. You have to imagine that they're focusing on, on race running and full fuel at the moment. Certainly not where we expected them to be. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's got complete confidence in that car. You know, goes through the final chicane now. Not on a quick lap, does, does improve sector one. Let's see what the sector three looks like and doesn't go any quicker. So there, remember, Aston Martin are in a very different position from Ferrari. Ferrari got no upgrades this weekend, whereas Aston Martin have got quite a significant one on the side pods, as Harry was mentioning, also on the, the, the veins at the start of the floor, which are probably even more important than the side pod change. So Aston Martin, I think, will be approaching this first half of the session very much as a, an assessment exercise, working out what changes those uh, upgrades are making to the car. So you wouldn't expect them to be running lowish fuel. As I'm not saying Ferrari are running low fuel yet, because I think they'll, they'll take some more fuel out. But you wouldn't expect them to be doing performance runs per se right now. You'd be expecting them to try to work out what the car's doing and then go for, for, perform, for performance runs, sorry. Uh, whereas Ferrari can move forward a bit more quickly on that front. On... Um I'm going to come back to you this, Andrew, sorry. On Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes, uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, his contract and whether he'd signed it or not. Positive talks coming from both him and Toto Wolff. Has there been any movement on that since Spain? Well, they have had talks. Uh, Hamilton admitted that yesterday, but they haven't come to a conclusion yet. Um, I think, you know, I mentioned this in the podcast yesterday. If anyone wants to listen to that, they can download it on BBC Sounds, by the way. Um, lots of people are getting very excited about Lewis Hamilton's contract. I'm not doing. Not because I'm not excited about the idea of Lewis Hamilton staying at Mercedes next year. Just because I don't think there's any doubt, and I don't think there ever has been. Since, I can't remember exactly when, but midway through last year, because Hamilton's contract was coming to an end at the end of this year, People have been saying, what's going to happen? Are you staying in Formula One? And 
he did a bit of umming and ahhing at the beginning, but pretty much from about October last year, I remember I did an interview with him and he said he wanted to stay in Formula One. And he's always been so completely open about his desire to finish his career with Mercedes. It's hard to take seriously any idea of him moving to Ferrari, for example, when all he ever says is how he wants to stay with Mercedes for the rest of his life, not just the rest of his career, but the rest of his life. You know, he talks about Sterling Moss and like, and, and how he went on forever with Mercedes. And uh, uh, so we've got a car with smoke coming out of it, a Haas here, Harry. Uh, it's, yeah, trundling along the main straight. It's Nico Hulkenberg in the Haas, and there is smoke coming out of the back of it as he makes his way uh, just over uh, the chequered flag. Here he is. <laughs> So I lost the engine, I lost drive. And uh, confirming where that smoke is coming from then, engine gone for Hulkenberg. He's, he might be able to just coast it uh, and then turn left where the pit lane feeds out. There's a little bit of a, of a gap of, of runoff area, but that smoke is actually uh, building up quite a lot. He's off the racing line and he has stopped that car. Uh, Nico Hulkenberg then clambers out of his Haas and with just over an hour to go. So we're nearly through that first extra 30 minutes that we've been handed due to the red flag in FP1. We now have another flag, a red flag in FP2 as Hulkenberg uh, watches on on his stricken Haas. Rosanna. Yeah, absolutely. Out of the car pretty quickly. Lots of smoke pouring out of the Haas there and unfortunately unable to get it uh, away from the racing track. I know off the racing line, but this might take a little bit of time to, to get the car away. And Nico's beckoning to the marshals to come over and help. But yes, a lot of smoke, very dirty smoke as well. It really is, isn't it? Uh, and it's still pouring out. Nico Hulkenberg trying to uh, usher over the marshals, and they are now on track with the extinguishers uh, getting to work very quickly. Uh, so uh, everybody else will start to feed back in to the pit lane and get into their garages. The clock in practice still continues to count down, unlike in qualifying. Uh, so uh, we are still now approaching the hour mark. But a few concerned looks down at Haas. And they actually had some good qualifying form here last year uh, with Kevin Magnussen and Mick Schumacher both qualifying, uh, I think it was fifth and sixth, um, in the certainly both in the top ten. Uh, and Nico Hulkenberg being quite vocal in the build-up to this weekend as well, saying that uh, as great as it is to have qualifying, we need race pace. Let's hear how the Haas engine expired. Uh, it sounds like he was grabbing third gear, I believe, leaving the final chicane and uh, yeah, just completely completely shut off as you hear on the audio continuing on board here with him um and yeah when when there's smoke out here <laughs> yeah when there's smoke there's fire so he's uh yeah bought himself some time by crawling to the end of pit lane while he's trying to undo his belts um these drivers and and everyone competing under the fia are required to uh, to have a, a extraction tests and um, they have to ex exit the car in a, in a, a minimum amount of time uh, in, in situations like this. Nico Hulkenberg has some great form around Canada, it must be said. Last race there back in 2019, uh, 7th, 2018, 7th, 2017, 8th, 16th was 8th, 15th, 8th, 14th, 5th, 2012 was 8th as well. And he was in midfield cars, so that pretty good results uh, for Nico Hulkenberg. Spain, conversely, it wasn't a great track for Nico Hulkenberg as he gets a cheer from the fans as he walks past the safety car at the end of the pit lane, back to his garage, gives them a little wave, uh, and uh, he'll be hoping that Haas uh, will be able to find a quick fix for that, perhaps an engine change. Uh, and uh, sadly, he managed to get, well, about 20 minutes of running in this uh, extended P2 session, but he won't get the full hour now. Andrew, can we talk about these two Haas drivers really quick? Because of course. both... Um, both drivers have had their careers reinvigorated. Like, maybe, maybe they were both considering retirement before coming back to Formula One. Well, Kevin Magnussen left Formula One and didn't expect to come back. Exactly. He was going to race, he was over racing uh, in the States in the endurance racing. Um, and Nico Hulkenberg was dropped by Renault um, at the end of 2019. Um, yeah. Um, so you're right. Um, I think both of them thought that was it, probably. But, um, and, Hulkenberg was always hoping because he did a few stand-in uh, appearances for 
the racing point and which team as it was named then and then Aston Martin as it became when there were various issues with COVID, for example, uh, in 2020 uh, and subsequently to that as well. Um, Magnussen got a call from Gunter Steiner, the uh, Haas team principal, out of the blue really when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and Nikita Mazepin had to be uh, sacked as a result of that. Um, and um, Magnussen came back and I think that um, what happened was I think they got their fingers burnt basically Haas by they, they employed um, Mazepin and Mick Schumacher thinking that they were going into a holding year um, and therefore the driver quality didn't matter that much they wanted to save money both of them brought money um, and they thought well let's just concentrate on making a better car for 2022 when the regulations changed but it backfired because they weren't very quick and they kept crashing. Um, and so when Mazepin got fired, Steiner decided, well, that w approach didn't work. I'm going to go for proven quality that I know. And that's why he called Magnussen. And I mean, Kevin Magnussen, he's a lovely guy. Uh, he's a very, very good Formula driver. He's not top draw. You know, he's not Hamilton, Alonso, Verstappen level, Leclerc, you know, but he's, he's a very, very capable Formula 1 driver. Same with Nico Hülkenberg. And that's what has need in their position as a midfield team. So you're telling me there's hope that I can take a year off of racing and get back to my 100%, 100%. Keep the faith. Right, well, both, both drivers came back. Way back, uh, Nico Hülkenberg dropped to the end of 2010, 2011 on the sidelines, came back. Hülkenberg, uh, Magnussen dropped twice as well. McLaren, then Renault. Uh, well, then Haas, I should say. So it's definitely doable, Oliver. I mean, I, uh, don't, I don't watch Formula E that much, Oliver, but yeah, I seem, you seem to think you did a pretty decent job last year, so I don't see any reason why you can't be coming back. Yeah? Towards the end of the year, I yeah. felt like I was, yeah. I was at my best, certainly. He got it together in the end, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, Rosanna is uh, down as they, uh, the Haas car has been wheeled back into the pit lane. It has, and it is covered with what was sprayed over it by the fire extinguisher. The marshals have run it into the pit lane, the pit exit, and the Haas mechanics were running up to receive the car. And you, I just saw a little bit, I glimpsed it, just a little bit of the bodywork slightly peeled. So I'm not sure what was going on there, maybe from the heat, uh, but there's been a bit of a discussion. I've been watching the mechanics talk to the marshals. Uh, obviously, not pleased that the car is now covered in all of this substance which will have to be removed and I, I think it's going to be a, a big fixing job there because I'm not sure it's as simple as just washing it off. It might be uh, but it might need some uh, bodywork attention. Yeah, certainly not the start uh, that Haas and Nico Hülkenberg were hoping to get. But uh, they've uh, they've had the qualifying pace so far this year. Not so much uh, the race pace. Both struggling. Both drivers actually uh, struggling with uh, the, the Haas in race conditions. In what has become an incredibly competitive midfield all of a sudden with the rise of Aston Martin. Now the battle for really ninth, tenth has become embroiled between the remainder of the teams. It might be an Alpha Tauri, it might be a Williams, it might be an Alfa Romeo or a Haas at one stage, but really they're only getting rewarded for one or two points for, for hard-earned effort uh, as uh, uh, Nico Hülkenberg is now back into the garage uh, and uh, takes a sip of his drink and uh, wanders back into uh, the uh, back of the garage for, I'm sure, a little bit of a debrief there and to figure out what they're going to do for the rest of the weekend. Still red flag conditions then, 54 minutes and 13, 12, 11 seconds on the clock. Charles Leclerc has the fastest time, a 1.14.0 in front of Verstappen. Signs Bottas up there in the Alfa Romeo uh, is in fourth in front of Gasly, who rounds out the top five. Piastri, Magnussen, Perez, Albon, Norris, the top ten. Ocon, De Vries, Sergeant Stroll, Alonso, the top 15. Sonoda, Joe, Hülkenberg, Hamilton and Russell, 19th and 20th for Mercedes, all on different tyres, uh, a collection of soft and mediums, and all have been running uh, different run plans up until uh, this 53-minute point that we're at at the moment moment yeah that Haas looks like it's in pretty bad shape I I think it's more than just bodywork damage on that car uh, I wouldn't want to see uh, what that looks like with the bonnet off you say the bonnet uh, the, the bonnet or the, the, bonnet. the rear engine, bodywork engine yeah, cover. the engine yeah. cover one of those Plus, three I just make a little <laughs> point about Haas by the way so Nico Hülkenberg's already used two internal combustion engines this year it looks to me like he's just lost one of them yeah so he'll be on his third tomorrow and this is only race uh, nine race eight this eight, will be right. yeah so round nine I think there eight, might be a penalty looming for Nico uh, later in the year 
there might well be. We've got to be uh, uh, see how the allocations uh, stack up now. Of course, they were uh, they were initially only allocated three for the season for the internal combustion engine, the motor ge generator unit, uh, MGU-H, uh, and three for the MGUK along with the turbocharger. That was all up to four. But with the uh, energy store, control, electronics, and exhaust, oh, well, that's at eight, but the other are on two apiece. Something to watch out for. Uh, for... Um, Haas and Nico Hulkenberg, but you'll be pleased to hear the sounds of Formula One cars back out on track. Green flag is back out and running. Pit exit is open, and uh, Max Verstappen, along with Sergio Perez, Nick De Vries, Logan Sargent, Lance Stroll, and George Russell, all make their way out onto the track. Now we got into a lot of tyre chats during free practice one, uh, talking about um, the, the tire, warm, uh, tire warmers uh, being scrapped for next year, but still some concerns they might come back. But there was also a lot of talk, uh, and a few rumors rumbling about the, uh, the tire supplier within Formula One. Uh, Pirelli currently have the contract, but it looks set to face some competition uh, when the FIA put that contract up for tender uh, from 2025. And Andrew, there was rumours that we might see an old familiar brand back in Formula One. Indeed. So Bridgestone have lodged a bid to be the supplier for Formula One from 2025. Um, there's a tender process going on at the moment. Uh, you can read about this on the BBC Sport website, actually. The story's just gone live. Um, and uh, basically Pirelli and Bridgestone are in competition um, and I think it's fair to say that this is probably the most serious threat Pirelli have had since they came into Formula 1 in 2011. Bridgestone supplied tyres to Formula 1 from 1997 to 2010 um, in fact then pulling out was what led to whoa, and it shows your Perez has just nearly hit the wall on the exit of turn two there um, was that turn two? no no, no it was at turn uh, seven coming out of seven yeah um, bails out coming around through turns eight and nine Perez very messy lap for the Mexican there indeed yes that was, that was that was a scary moment for Sergio Perez anyway and they they were the supplier for Ferrari when they dominated from 2000 and from 2000 to 2004 with Michael Schumacher um, the tyres were renowned for being uh, durable. You could push really hard on them throughout the race, which is one of the characteristics of the Pirellis that the Pirellis don't have. Ever since Pirelli came in in 2011, drivers have complained about overheating. You have to manage the tyres, be careful with them. And I understand uh, from sources that I've spoken to that Bridgestone's bid makes the point that they're confident that they can produce tyres that drivers can push harder on through races. I've spoken to a few drivers and a few senior figures this weekend. Um, uh, it's fair to say that, you know, they're taking this bid by Bridgestone very seriously. Some drivers definitely want Bridgestone in. Others uh, are a bit more open on the subject, but certainly not opposed to it. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that develops over the next few weeks. Basically, the, at the moment, the situation is that they've both submitted their bids. Um, the FIA analysed them uh, on a sort of sporting level uh, to see whether they are considered to be competent. I think there's, don't think there's any doubt whatsoever that both of them will be considered competent. In fact, Pirelli's Mario Isola has already told me that that's, they have been told that already. Um, and then once the FIA have made their decision, uh, it'll go to the Formula One who discuss commercial terms with both of them. I understand that the bids are both of a very similar level commercially at the moment, whether that changes or not, now that there's a, a process and some serious competition for Pirelli is a different matter. Well, that's uh, that's fascinating to hear, and you can read that full story now on the BBC Sport website. Uh, but that was certainly the rumours that were coming into this weekend as well, and I think people will, will be quite pleased to see that because there's been Pirelli have come under fire quite a lot over the last decade or, or so uh, the, with the tyre uh, blowouts as well that have occurred on numerous occasions uh, throughout the years, uh, particularly at Silverstone as well with the high speeds like 2013, 2021, but. The main crux of the issue that I think a lot of people are having right now, from a fan perspective perhaps, and from us watching and enjoying it, the, the tyres right now just lasting too long, it seems. It's all well and good pushing hard, but we, we, can't, we don't want to see 50 laps from Max Verstappen well, on a set of mediums, do we? I think there's, there's a lot of different issues conflated within that remark you've just made, because lasting long is one thing, driving on the limit and lasting long is another. So the, the teams and the drivers are always trying to make the fastest race time. 
and so they can, they calculate what's going to be the fastest race time. Do you push harder? Not that you can push hard because you, basically if you push really hard on a set of Pirellis for a couple of laps, they'll overheat and they'll drop off massively. But where, what's the optimum between how hard do you push and then the time you lose making extra pit stops for fresh sets of tyres? And it just works out. We've got Alpine stopped again here. This time it's Esteban Ocon, Harry, by the look of it. Yeah, I think this might be uh, on the exit of turn nine and the approach to the hairpin, perhaps. Uh, he's pulled off just after the, the chicane that comes through uh, in a little bit of runoff. Yeah, it is because uh, there's a big orange sign which says go left if you run wide here. And that's if you uh, mess up turn eight, which is the fast right hand, a straight into the left of nine. And then that brings you uh, onto the short straight that leads up to the hairpin. Uh, the sporting director, Alan Permain, looking on uh, with a slight con uh, concerned look. Unfortunately, they got the caption wrong there. That was senior engineer oh, yeah. Karen Pilby, <laughs> it not was, Alan Permain. It? That was my bad. I should never trust the graphics. Uh, <laughs> I think they look a bit similar, though, don't they? Or am I completely not? I think I, Karen Pilby's got long oh. hair and Alan Permain very much hasn't. Oh, we, so. no, you're right. Yeah. Oh, no, you are right. Okay. Anyway, Esteban Ocon's day looking like it may be done. The headset, the headrest is coming out of that Alpine. Uh, let's see how it happened there. We're just being shown a replay. So he's coming through already quite slowly, right on the apex of the left-hander of uh, turn nine, and then just simply pulls off into that little gap of runoff. This is the sound of that Alpine. Stop the car, stop the car, stop the car. So that's two mechanical issues uh, for two separate cars on the same team in, uh, in Alpine. So we see many times in Formula One when there's one issue with a car on the team, it could quite possibly be the same issue on the other. So um, we'll see here at some point if it is. Yeah, it's uh, uh, a real shame then for Esteban Ocon and Alpine. Uh, Pierre Gasly was the... Uh, cause of the red flag in FP1 with uh, gearbox issues, we believe, but his Alpine was just coming to the pits, was out there. Um, and uh, great that they were able to get him out in time for free practice too. Uh, and he currently sits fifth fastest in that Alpine. So uh, finding some pace there, he's about six and a half tenths off of Carlos Sainz right now, but it's difficult to really get a proper view of the competitive order right now. Sainz, Leclerc, Verstappen, Bottas and Gasly are indeed the top five. And that has brought out though a red flag. So another one, once again. You know, I read a stat coming into this weekend that we've not actually had a red flag in the Canadian Grand Prix since 2011, the longest race ever, of course, over four hours and uh, the one that Jensen Button won on the final lap. I couldn't believe that, but yet in two practice sessions so far, we've uh, pretty much had majority red flag running, three red flags in total. Uh, so uh, clearly making up for lost time then for red flags here at the Canadian Grand Prix. Uh, this is the sound of Yuki Tsunoda. What happens to him? He goes into turn one, locks up, and uh, then decides to uh, take an interesting line back onto the track. He goes into the big runoff of turn one, and normally you can just then cut that complete corner and run across the grass, but he decides he doesn't want to risk that, so uh, he does a little bit of a Yui and comes back on uh, in uh, just before the pit lane feeds out into turn two. Yeah, so, so no lack of commitment from Yuki Tsunoda there in turn one, uh, breaking very late. And it's not a smooth circuit, this one, Andrew. Um, you know, there, there's changes in, in pavement as, you, as, uh, as we see in our, our, uh, our vision here. And uh, when, when, when's the last time this track was paved, you know? A long time ago, I think. I don't think they've resurfaced it for a while. There was a year when the track was breaking up because it had been repaved. But we're looking at a helicopter shot now of the corner where Esteban Ocon went off and there's actually like a sort of rectangular chunk of a different colour of asphalt, isn't there? Where they've obviously inlaid a little bit on the racing line and left the rest of it um, the same. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah no, I was going to mention earlier, uh, Fernando Alonso's line through turn two he was he was visibly trying to stay tight on that new pavement and on paper uh it's it's common that the new pavement has more grip than the old so that was interesting to see from him well while we've got time uh to discuss i suppose the latest news going on in formula one Andrew, what do we know uh, about the, uh, the the changes down at alfa romeo salba uh with uh, the current technical director jan monchot set to be or is going to be replaced uh, by 
the former McLaren technical director, James Key, uh, from around September. Uh, and uh, while we're discussing that, we'll just let you know that it's looking a little bit dark and ominous uh, at downtown Montreal as the rain is coming in. Uh, so perhaps we just, uh, we, I'll come back to you on that, Andrew. We'll deep dive into the technical uh, changes going on in the teams. Uh, but perhaps it's time for a weather update with Rosanna. Oh, I knew you'd come to me for that. <laughs> <laughs> You're upstairs in the commentary box looking out at the central business di district of uh, Montreal and seeing the dark clouds. I'm starting to panic. It's going to rain on me. Uh, yes, they are much darker uh, over towards the city. Uh, so almost sort of as I'm looking away to pit in, uh, that's where the dark clouds are gathering. We had rain yesterday. Could it be the same? And with 42 minutes and 25 seconds on the clock, we need this session to go the whole way. The teams will want it to stay dry so that they can focus on their upgrades and learn as much as they can, especially given FP1's difficulties with the limited running. At the moment, I can't feel any raindrops. That's what you were wanting to find out, weren't you? Whether there was rain, it's just clouds, very dark clouds at the moment in the distance. Yes, they are looking ominous, though, uh, aren't they? Thanks, Rosanna, for that. Uh, green flag running back underway. Red flag has gone away, and we're straight back out to try and uh, get that all in running in as the Alfa Romeo uh, storms through uh, turns eight and nine, which is my way of segging back to what we were just discussing about with the technical director changes down at Alfa Romeo slash Salba. Yes, so this is the last year that Alfa Romeo will be called Alfa Romeo, though I don't know what they're going to be called next year, actually, because what's happening is that team is gradually being taken over by Audi, who are entering Formula One in 2026, and Andreas Seidel, the, uh, who's the now the chief executive officer of Sauber officially at the moment, although he was employed by Audi to turn the team into it's Audi. It's really clean cut, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> he came over from uh, from McLaren in a sort of big team boss switcheroo that all happened over the winter with um, Fred Vasseur moving from Sauber to Ferrari, a sidle moving from uh, McLaren to um, Sauber, and then uh, who went to McLaren? Was Andrea Stella was promoted at, uh, at McLaren from... Uh, performance engineer to team principal and uh, there's been a whole load of changes at McLaren since then. So yeah, I mean, basically the pressure is on at uh, Sauber stroke Audi because Audi are not coming into Formula 1 to play around. The new engine regulations coming in in 2026, the proportion of hybrid power from the engine in terms of its overall output is going up from about 20% to about 50%. And uh, that's attracted uh, Audi in, along with the simplification of the engines. And it's Seidel's job to turn a team that has the slowest car on average over the start of this season into a car that can compete with Red Bull at the front of the field. And no, I don't envy him that at all. Um, James Key is a he's a respected te technical director, but it's, I think it's fair to say he's not regarded in, by anyone uh, with the same... Uh, or as someone like Adrian Newey or uh, Red Bull or James Allison at Mercedes. So it's an interesting choice uh, from Seidel, who obviously has great faith in Key from having worked with him at McLaren. Um, and obviously the drivers will be under pressure there too, because uh, I think uh, when it turns into Audi, that's going to become quite a appealing seat for a lot of people. Rumours already about Lando Norris potentially going there, because Seidel worked with him at McLaren too. So uh, lots to come uh, at that team. Well, it's certainly going to be an interesting couple of years. I imagine, surely they'll just go back to being Sauber for a year, like they were back in 2012 and 11 after BMW left. Uh, but it's uh, it's always a fun one trying to discover what the Alfa Romeo Sauber uh, uh, lineup will be. Uh, Bottas and Joe Guan Yu at the moment at the uh, wheel of those two Alfa Romeos. And they had a really good result here last year as well, both in the points for the Alfa Romeos. But it, unfortunately, it's not been a brilliant season for them. Started off well for Bottas but has really plummeted since. So Joe Guan Yu, though, one of the, I think, drives of his career, actually, in, in Spain last time out, benefiting from the penalty uh, that Yuki Tsunoda received, and there was a lot of talk about whether that was justified. Either way, Joe Guan Yu benefited and uh, managed to get a ninth-place finish and a couple of points out of it. So let's see if they can try and carry that form over this weekend. Uh, 38 minutes and 43 seconds on the clock, and the two Mercedes have now swapped off at the medium compound tyre and gone on to the softs to try and improve their lap times. And uh, Hamilton is in fifth, and George Russell has just crossed the line, and he is ninth. And Harry, they're not going very fast, yes. the Mercedes. <laughs> um, and actually, as I, I said in the commentary, where we were filling lots of dead airtime. Were we? In P1. Um, Russell was saying yesterday that uh, 
he wasn't that optimistic about the Mercedes performance. It's obviously only first practice, and that's only their first lap, so I'm not going to jump to too much too much of a conclusion. But Hamilton's fastest time on the soft tyre there was a 1 minute 14.3, which is half a second slower than Carlos Sainz, who's the pace setter at the moment in the Ferrari, and Russell uh, on a 14.6, so three tenths further back, Oliver. Yeah, and uh, the two Ferrari cars, contrary to the Mercedes, are looking very sporty. One and two at the moment on the timing charts. Um, we see our, our track dominance um, uh, graphic on our screen. Signs taking up the majority of the track versus Max Verstappen, who has um, the fastest micro sector in one and two, as well as three, four, and five. What have we made of Carlos Signs this year? Because I feel like you, it's hard to judge the Ferrari drivers at, because of the car that they've got, and clearly it's not where they want it to be. But actually, Carlos Sainz sits sixth in the constructors' standings uh, with 58 points. Charles Leclerc, yes, a couple of retirements, but that horrendous Spanish Grand Prix result as well means he has uh, fallen behind him. He's down in seventh. Uh, but, uh, for, for a team, Rosanna, where everyone thinks that you know Leclerc is the golden boy, he is the, the man behind Ferrari, right now, on paper, is Carlos Sainz, who is, who is having the more consistent and the better results. Certainly is, and if you look at the timesheets right now, he's two tenths clear of his teammate Charles Leclerc. It does seem, doesn't it, Harry, that actually Carlos just seems more relaxed, maybe a little bit more positive in terms of, of what he's doing, maybe not about the car, but in fact, just about his own performance, whereas Charles I think we were talking about it in FP1, is, is more frustrated. And yes, you've mentioned there have been uh, difficulties for him with the car and the race results and the qualifying results and a sort of frustration at not knowing why. And Andrew Benson was making the point that he's very like Gilles Villeneuve, sort of wears his heart on his sleeve a little more. And that seems to be tripping him up. OK, the car might be too. But Carlos seems to be able to, to weather the storm at the moment a little better. Whether that can translate into true race pace on Sunday, this particular Sunday, uh, remains to be seen but yes Carlos seems to just be sort of ducking and diving quite nicely and keeping his head above the water I think it's fair to, obviously science has uh, more points than Leclerc but um, it's also true that Leclerc's had a series of problems some of them his own making some of them not he crashed in Australia on the first lap um, with L uh, Lance Stroll um, he crashed in Miami he had a very difficult weekend in Miami um, and uh, obviously he had the difficulty in Spain in qualifying. But the wider picture in terms of underlying performance is whatever psychological struggles Charles Leclerc is going through, he is demonstrably the faster of the two Ferrari drivers. Uh, on average in qualifying, he's more than two tenths quicker than Sainz, which is the biggest advantage he's had uh, through their career so far. Yeah, and I, I want to add on that subject, um, as a racing fan, as a viewer of, of Formula One, it seems that Carlos Sainz is, is less affected by the ups and downs and the emotions of motorsport, whereas um, Charles Leclerc can sometimes, you know, is visibly upset and, um, and, and on, on the other side of things, ecstatic when things go well. And, um, you know, I'm not... I'm not, I'm not down on, on one side or the other. It's just two different styles of, of going about things. And um, it's sometimes said that the emotional driver can get more out of the car and, and, and push it that extra step. Oh, that was a bit tight. Uh, we're just uh, seeing a replay of uh, the Haas of Kevin Magnussen. This is the sound you're hearing on board with him coming into the pits. That was close. Was that the Alpha Tauri? Yeah. It was indeed the Alpha Tauri which was making an exit, and uh, it was Nick uh, Yuki Sonoda who was uh, making. Oh, Nick De Vries, apologies. That was tricky. So we couldn't get away quick enough, really. It was really a slow getaway, and by the time it was green, it so it went quickly red again. But De Vries was already pulling out. But just couldn't get enough drive and that ended with a little bit of a close shave uh, we'll see if race control have a look at that one um coming back to the signs leclerc stuff uh, quickly just sort of round it off it's very interesting because we were having the complete opposite kind of chat this time last year when you look at looked at carlos signs and he had a really tough start to the year he was out 
uh, on lap one in Australia in the gravel. He was just struggling to get that car to the end. And even when he was in a good position, he'd, something would happen, he would fall backwards. So how the tables can turn quite quickly. And it, it comes back to that discussion, Ollie, we were, happen we were having an FP1, I think, about the importance of, I suppose, momentum and, and having uh, good results, but also just consistency within how the car reacts and your results to then power you forward. Oh, how the turntables. <laughs> yeah, the confidence in racing and, and in any sport, as I've said earlier on, on the broadcast, it's so important. And, and it's that, that X factor that some of these drivers bring, um, you know, how, how they carry themselves and, and that success forward and to, you know, help, help that team and the aura around the driver. The drivers are the quarterback. Uh, of the team, or, or how would you say, the team captain? Yeah, in, in, the captain. In, in football. Um, so it's, it's extremely important for them to you know, bring the team together and, and keep that workflow going, and um, that, that just comes along with confidence and, and, um, and success. Just over half an hour then, left remaining of free practice two, and uh, we have all cars still in this session, bar Nico Hulkenberg in the Haas, which went up in flames uh, after his engine failed on him. So he is not out there. He managed to do 11 laps before uh, it called time on that Haas. So work to do uh, down at the, uh, the American-based team. Just one final point on the Ferrari drivers to give it a bit of full, comple uh, full complexity of the picture. Leclerc is 16 points behind Sainz in the Drivers' Championship at the moment. He retired with an engine failure from the first race while running third. So if it wasn't for that, he'd only be a point behind despite all the other difficulties that he's had. So that's the kind of point I was trying to make about yeah. performance. You know. So it is easy. The, the things you see on paper don't really recollect what always happens in Formula 1. Uh, I was lying when I said Nico Hulkenberg was the only driver out of this session. Uh, Esteban Ocon is also. He pulled up in the middle sector. Uh, and I believe Rosanna has news on that. Yes, I've just been talking to the team and they say that Esteban stopped just as a precaution due to a suspected loss of water pressure on the car. And I think the team are going to investigate the cause of that after the session. I assume it might have been difficult to get the car back. Uh, so not what Alpine want. We've been talking about the momentum. You've just been talking about momentum with Carlos Sainz and the need for it for, for Charles Leclerc. But Alpine having a, a really great run of form at the moment. And so these little foibles on Friday are not going to help. Rain is coming in 10 minutes. Well, better get the umbrella ready, Rosanna, because uh, Nick DeVries' engineer is saying rain is coming in 10 minutes. We've got half an hour of the session remaining. Is it, is it looking a bit more grey, Rosanna? Oh, well, not where I am, but yes, just to my right. And I'm underneath a rather lovely break in the clouds. Just a little one, not too much blue sky, but uh, yes, to my right, as I say, where the, the drivers enter the pits, uh, very dark, and the contrast between the green of the trees, the lush trees around the lake here on the Ile Notre Dame, contrast that with the dark dark grey skies and I have to say I've just got a little little goosebumps going on now as well. <laughs> uh, well uh, good luck uh, we, we'll, we'll say in the, the dry commentary box uh, for now no rain there yet though 30 minutes on the clock this is the sound of George Russell who's putting in a fast lap he's gone purple in the middle sector two tenths up currently through the hairpin and now up through the gears foot to the floor down the back straight DRS open for George Russell and you can just hear the bottom of the floor just skirting slightly on the surface of the track. A little bit of, dare I say, porpoising, a little bit of bouncing through the chicane. Nicely does it out through the final corner. DRS open and across the line for George Russell. What can he do? It's wow. fastest for George Russell. 113.7, just under a tenth faster than Carlos Sainz. What can his teammate Lewis Hamilton do? That's the sound you hear as we ride on board with the seven-time champion. He's got a little bit of traffic in front of him, but I think it's just enough ahead of him not to have caused him too much uh, time loss. And he goes faster as well. So suddenly, from being 19th and 20th, Lewis Hamilton and George Russell are now one and two in the Mercedes. Yeah, and those drivers were doing race running earlier in the session, clearly, um, as they were second to last and last for the majority of that, that first portion of the session and now clearly going for the, the push laps. I think that was only their second or third um, qualifying lap attempt. Um, I, I would imagine this is low fuel, fresh tires, and um, yeah, the more the more qualifying lap attempts that they do, that the more in rhythm that they're going to become, getting the most out of the car. And yes, clearly things starting to work for Mercedes. Yeah, half a tenth between the two Mercedes at the moment. Up front, Roseanne. Well, I don't want to put a dampener on things, but quite literally in a minute, but 
Track evolution is so powerful here. So perhaps we're just sort of rubbering the track in. I think the change between, or the delta as we call it, obviously in Formula One, the change between FP1 and Q3 last year was over six seconds. So, uh, and of course the conditions played a part in that, but it does rubber in quite a lot, given it is a sort of semi-permanent track. Uh, so it's quite green and dusty to start with. So we might see the times tumble. It might not be the upgrades. Well, we'll see shortly as I believe that's Sergio Perez starting his his push lap. Um, it is indeed coming I down. I think he's trying a race run, run actually. Okay. I'm, I'm tracking the oh, race. He's on the medium. The he's on yeah. the medium compound. Yeah, uh, Hamilton Russell were indeed on the uh, the soft tyres. Uh, Perez is on the medium, currently down in eighth fastest, just starting uh, a bit of a long run for him. Uh, well, it is Hamilton, Russell, Sainz, Leclerc, and Verstappen the top five. Bottas, Alonso, Perez, Stroll, Gasly the top ten. Piastri, Magnussen, Norris, Joe, Sonoda the top fifteen. Then it's De Vries, Albon, Ocon, Sargent, and Hulkenberg twentieth uh, and last. Last, but Ocon stopping on track earlier on uh, and that car no longer taking part with issues and Hulkenberg's Haas going up in smoke with the engine failing on him. Uh, so they are not taking part in this session so they will have a lot of work to recover tomorrow for FP3 ahead of qualifying on Saturday here for the Canadian Grand Prix. Fernando Alonso just slots up to split the two Ferraris. Uh, three tenths of Hamilton in fourth position for Fernando Alonso. We talk about how tricky this track actually can be, Oliver. Precision is the word that a lot of people are using and you've really got to sort of bounce over the curves to really get that good build in the car as Perez comes to uh, the line and uh, continues his long run. We've got three rookies in the field. Oscar Piastri, uh, Nick De Vries, Logan Sargent have never raced here. Add no. to that the truncated practice sessions we've had. How difficult is it even more for a rookie? Because is it comparable to you with, with, with Formula E? You were a rookie, but also Formula E races on uh, kind of purpose-built tracks that, that could well be designed for, for one year only. Yeah, F3, F2, none of those support series come here um, unless you're racing Ferrari Challenge or a Formula Ford F1600. So yeah, none of these rookies have experience at this circuit, although um, they do run a lot on the simulator, uh, especially the rookies, and, and coming to uh, a new track like this for them. Um, yeah, most of these teams have simulators in-house where they can run day and night as much as they want, and um, they, they do have their in-house um, simulator drivers as well on the weekends, you know, making sure that the uh, setup changes, that they're like, basically back, back checking um, the setup changes they're doing through the weekend on the simulator back at base. So yeah, a big challenge ahead for, for the three rookies in this championship. Um, although they're very experienced racing drivers and they're, they're here for a reason. They're, they're going to pick it up quickly. How have you rated our rookies so far? Uh, obviously, Oscar Piastri in the McLaren. Uh, Nick De Vries, bit of a struggle uh, uh, compared to his teammates. Certainly pressure being applied for him by the Red Bull bosses uh, down at AlphaTauri. And then, of course, Logan Sargent in the Williams, who uh, I think started off quite strong, but currently sits plumb last in the, in the standings, having had uh, a few, few tough races uh, on the trot. I think all the drivers have shown moments of brilliance. Um, I would say I'm most impressed with Oscar. Um, just you know, comparing him to to how Ricardo did to Lando Norris uh, last year. So um, certainly, it's it's a difficult car to drive. The progression this year has been difficult for that team. Uh, but yeah, I would say that Oscar Piastri, with how close that he's getting to Lando Norris, who, as we know, is one of the stars in this championship, I think has been most impressive. Um, as we see Lando Norris go through the final chicane. Um, I, I, of the three drivers, Oscar's the only one I don't know personally. Logan, um, you know, we, we grew up together in South Florida. He was racing karts alongside me, and I raced against, um, uh, sorry, Nick DeVries last year in Formula E. So um, we had a couple of run-ins together, actually. He's, uh, he's a very fierce racing driver and um, has had a struggle here, I would say, so far in this season. But still a long time to go, and um, I, I think we've yet to see the best uh, of these three rookies this year. I suppose the real benefit for, for one of these rookies in particular, and I talk about Piastri, is having Mark Webber 
as as your manager, as, as your as your confidant, someone who can guide you and knows how tough it can be. Uh, the former Red Bull Formula One driver, multiple winner, uh, Sebastian Vettel's teammate. He certainly had his fair share of political drama in Formula One, but also incredibly fast. A Le Mans winner too with Porsche. How beneficial is that for him? Well, you have Mark Webber, who has so much experience in, in Formula One and has made all of the mistakes um, as, as someone you know, going through that, that, that experience would. And um, having someone like that relay that information to a rookie driver in Oscar Piastri is, is invaluable. Um, and so he's, yeah, he's locked at the hip with, with Oscar. And um, yeah, he's, Oscar seems like someone that's, that's a sponge and he's just willing to absorb all the information that he can. Um, a very smart driver. And uh, yeah, cer certainly something um, that he cherishes having Mark Webber alongside him. Have you ever uh, had that where you've been able to, uh, to to ask advice of someone, or have you ever felt like you needed to? Yeah, there was a couple of drivers uh, on my way to to IndyCar uh, that had helped me out. Um, one being James Hinchcliffe. Uh, the other being Robert Wickens, uh, who, who sat alongside me, um, you know, in the engineering debriefs when I was at McLaren for my first uh, IndyCar season in 2020. Um, both very experienced drivers and, and very fast drivers. Well, 22 minutes on the clock remaining of free practice two. Hamilton fastest ahead of Russell Sainz, Alonso and Leclerc. Uh, the top five, Alonso just came into the garage and wheeled back into it for uh, a little bit of a debrief. And Hamilton joins him uh, with the clouds gathering more and more and rain threatening these uh, last 20 minutes or so of free practice too. Is this my chance? Is this my moment? This is the it's moment you, I've been you. waiting for all day. Well, it's five minutes left to go in this FP2 session. Ladies and gentlemen, listeners of BBC Five Live, it's time! Long Run Corner with Andrew Benson. Well, it's great being introduced by Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right, so I've got some long runs here from uh, Mercedes, uh, sorry, Ferrari and Red Bull. And do you know what? It's actually really encouraging for Ferrari. Charles Leclerc, Carlos Sainz, Max Verstappen, Sergio Perez are all out on the medium tyres. And with the same number of laps, Leclerc's average is only half a tenth slower than Max Verstappen's. That's like nine laps of a race run. And for a team that's been struggling with tyre degradation over a long run, that's, that's a massively positive performance from him. Carlos Sainz isn't quite as quick, about a couple of tenths further back, and Perez has been having a bit of a difficult time on his race run, although he seems to be getting down to some reasonable lap times now, but he's uh, a long way off the other three. Uh, but yeah, so uh, just to give you the numbers, Max Verstappen, after nine uh, laps that you can count, one minute 17.543 seconds as an average. Charles Leclerc, one minute 17.607. Mercedes did their long runs earlier, so we can't compare. And Fernando Alonso hasn't done one yet, so we can't look at him either. OK, thank you, Andrew Benson. Um, have, we, have we got Oliver Askew back, or is, is, is Michael McConaughey still here? I've been here. <laughs> Matthew, who's Michael? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew McConaughey, here's George Russell. Is it rain still incoming? Looks like it might be just missing us now. And uh, George Russell then waiting for the rain. Uh, and of course, <laughs> I think it was the Spanish Grand Prix, wasn't it? Uh, last time out where he thought there was rain, but it turned out it was sweat, his own sweat, uh, coming through onto his helmet. Uh, so we're uh, just double checking with the team then. So the rain, as the clouds, especially overlooking the back straight, get darker and darker, but you look at the commentary box window where we are, which is overlooking the pit lane and uh, and the the, uh, the main straight. It's a little bit brighter, so uh, but it is it is definitely getting darker. But the rain might well just miss us. We shall see. We've got 19 minutes or so before we find out if it comes or not. Were you happy with your performance there? I'm not joking when I say that I've been waiting for that all day. That was that was my moment, like my spotlight. There were 10 different versions of that as well. So. We went with the southern, the southern accent in Whoa. one as Gasly has a very big moment coming through. Uh, turns three, 
and into four as he came through the exit of four, clouts the curve and loses the rear end. Good, massive moment and, and four. The rear is completely gone. Yeah, massive moment uh, is an understatement, I would say. That was some a formula drift moment for Pierre Gasly. Uh, a power down oversteer as he just misses the exit wall. And I have to, it's my pleasure to report back, uh, hashtag BBC F1. Uh, Kaylee, someone soundbite Oliver Askew so we can have it as the intro to Long Run Corner every time. I beg of you. Uh, Nala, good golly, Ollie, that sounded awesome. Uh, Daniel, OMG, Oliver, you can come back. So uh, I think you've done a good job there, Oliver Askew. So well done. Oh, I'm going to sleep well tonight. <laughs> and that's all that really matters. Uh, Okay, this is the sound of the only Canadian in the field, uh, Lance Stroll and the Aston Martin, who is uh, currently, uh, uh, what's he on? He's on the medium tire, isn't he? So he's on a long run. Uh, he's ninth fastest at the moment and uh, getting uh, some crucial data. He's uh, completed about 26 laps. So this will be his 27th lap of this free practice two session so far for Stroll. Now, Oliver, what do you do? And because this is your first time in the commentary box with us, it would be great to get your opinions on this. What do you do if you're Lance Stroll, your dad owns the team, but you are absolutely nowhere near your teammate Fernando Alonso? <laughs> what do you do? Oh, do you? Do, is there pressure? Is there any pressure? Do you care? Certainly. I mean, where else is he going to go? And oh, on the we grid? got. A, sorry to interrupt, okay. you, Oliver. We got a wall of champions. I don't want to answer that question anyway. So go yeah. on. <laughs> We've got a wall of champions uh, victim, but he manages to. Uh, Still carry on. It's Oscar Piastri. Put the wall and they go to the last corner uh, with the rewrite. Feels okay so far. He does indeed, and he's described it very well. Both the uh, front right and the rear left make contact with the dreaded wall of champions, uh, but he lives to fight another day. A few sparks flying up in the air, but I imagine he'll be pitching at the end of the lap to have a little check over of that. But I would say that bodes well for Oscar Piastri. Not a champion. Well, he is a champion. He's an F2 and an F3 champion. Yeah. Not quite an F1 champion yet. I want to compliment the tone of Oscar there on the radio. This is very clear, concise, um, gave the right information back to the team. And um, yeah, that, that follows along with, with his feedback in general. Um, comments about about the car. You know, I, I hear that he's he, ha he has very good feed feedback and a, and a feeling and a good feeling of the car, and um, that's important for engineers to have, especially in a team that's struggling. They need some kind of guidance. Uh, I still want to make you answer that, Lance Stroll. Oh, question, I'm please. Pass. Let's bring it to Andrew. <laughs> Andrew's working. He's busy. Uh, we've got a yellow flag out of sector one briefly, though, so uh, we'll see if that stays out or not. At the moment, it is certainly lingering, and it's got green flag again. But in all seriousness, seriousness yeah. though, Lance Stroll did a, an amazing job, I think, at the start of the year to, to, to do as well as he did in a sixth-place finish in Bahrain after the worries about would he even be able to take part in the race, not doing pre-season testing because of a, of a wrist and a, a broken hand injury as well. It was talked with his, uh, his ankles too. So certainly... It wasn't the best of starts for Stroll, but an amazing feat to come back and do that. But then when you have Fernando Alonso on the podium in nearly every single race so far, bar two, it doesn't make for a pretty picture, especially when Aston Martin are fighting Mercedes, especially in the Constructors' Championship. Yeah. And they've just been pipped to second now. Yeah, I, I think Lance is a, is a really talented driver. I mean, you don't, you don't qualify on pole and, and put it on the front row um, in, in the rain as he did. I for, forget which races that those were but um you know he's clearly talented and i think fernando is the first driver that he's raced alongside that's really giving him uh, given him a hard time um you know he was able to so somewhat match sebastian vettel um, i would say last year but sebastian you know he's at that point i would say he was slightly past his his prime in formula one so um fernando clearly showing that he still has it it's a massive debate, isn't it? I'm sure we'll come back onto it. Um, Rosanna, are my, are my eyes deceiving me? Uh, I think we need a weather update. I'm pretty sure I saw a bit of, I don't know, it might be but lightning. Yeah, I can imagine you may have seen lightning. It's very weird. The wind has just really picked up. The trees are blowing all around the paddock. Uh, and I can see the trees just near the pit entry as well, really blowing. 
and it's suddenly got a lot colder and I'm actually watching one of the cameramen now I'm at the end of the pit lane looking uh, as he's being lowered down from the crane position we have wonderful positions uh, in Formula One to show you all the action but of course these cameramen go up at serious heights and he is being brought down on the crane at the moment so I think it could get quite sketchy I think quite quite windy and a bit of a storm well also on our race control a uh, wet track has been declared at 1745 local time as well so uh, although there's a lot of um, now i've been calling it pollen it's not pollen is it this well what is it oliver there's i have of, no idea so sort of i think it's residue off the tree we don't have seed pods. florida sea pods right you get those filigree seed pods you know with the kind of uh, dusty uh, cotton type effect. yeah oh okay it's that kind of thing all right and that was basically that is all floating around in the air, especially when there's quite a lot of tree cover. Uh, and you can see uh, uh, the, the, the surrounding lake very much picking up a, a bit of choppy water too, Oliver. Yeah, so it seems like it's just a massive tailwind um, going into the final chicane and, and onto the start finish straightaway. We saw a couple of drivers miss the final chicane um, the, and the wall of champions and just go straight onto the, uh, yeah, basically the pit entry and, and the rejoin lane. Um, and we know how aerodynamically sensitive these cars are. And with a tailwind in a heavy braking zone like that as, as the final... There, there's, yeah, Charles, Charles Leclerc almost going straight there again. Um, it's just very difficult on the brakes. It's okay, it's really gusty. Copy, copy. That was Valtteri Bottas then, and tallies up with what Rosanna was telling us. Uh, the wind certainly picking up then, as Charles Leclerc had a bit of a hairy moment through the final chicane and, and just darted uh, across it. And... Uh, brilliant shots that we're seeing of the sea pods in the air as Carlos Sainz powers his way through turns three and four in that red Ferrari and makes his way through 11 minutes and 48, 47 seconds on the clock remain. What's caught your eye, Oliver? Anything in particular from your first practice? I'll get your first practice yeah. sessions. Really, your only practice session because we can't really count FP1. Yeah. Well, well, just then we see a couple of cars going down the back straightaway, and um, they're, they're, it looks like they're uh, zigzagging slightly. And that's not the bumps. That's not um, anything else. But but the wind gust, you know, moving the car around on the straightaways. So um, yeah, you can you can imagine what these drivers are going through with the unpredictability with these gusts. This is uh, the sound of uh, Sergio Perez going quite slowly, but he's just getting out of the way of everybody. And also because he has gone on to the intermediate tyre. So he's gone on to the, the wet tyre. And just nice and easy going around here. Okay, so it seems like it, so it hasn't rained yet, as far as we know. But they might be running in a set of intermediate tyres. So... Why would, yeah, yeah, why getting would they a thumbs do that? Up. Why would they do that? Why would they do that? Um, Is that just to allow? For it's it? just to knock off the shine. Um, so in, in the case where it, where they have to transfer to an intermediate tire uh, during the race, they they don't have to then yeah take take half a lap or a lap or so to to, to run in the tire. Yeah. So, Andrew, I think they're all expecting that tomorrow is going to be very wet. And um, although there is a new wet tyre, extreme wet tyre, because there's two, there's two grades of uh, sort of treaded tyre. One's called the intermediate, which the, which is Perez is running now, which is the the light, the lower level of tread. And then there's what they what they call the extreme. There's a new extreme was uh, was um, introduced a couple of races ago. Um, but it's the inter that the, that the teams tend to favour in wet conditions because it's tended to be uh, a, just a better tyre fundamentally, so faster unless there's a lot of standing water. So I think they're looking at the forecast for tomorrow and thinking, how can we best prepare? And some of the teams, um, sorry, uh, some of the teams will prefer to start on a set of scrub tyres for something. You know, might be that well, might be what they what they favour for uh, flying up and qualifying, for example. Um, so th I think that's what we're looking at. It could also be that extra heat cycle on the tires. Um, you know, when, when you buy a, a brand new set of tires at the shop back home, they, they come with that shine, right? That's That can sometimes be very slick. Uh, so it could be something that they're doing there. Hamilton Radio. Well, the wind has picked up a lot, up to 40 kph gusts. Those are tornado winds. <laughs> it is. It's 
getting windier out there. Uh, and now Perez is, uh, was on the inters. He came back in after that lap and switched back on uh, to the medium compound tyre. But that has uh, spurred on the likes of Hamilton, Russell, both out there on the intermediates. Uh, so too Perez's teammate Max Verstappen. Uh, and I imagine a few others will join that process too before we may get suddenly a downpour or dare I say a deluge of rain which comes down in this uh, final closing eight minutes or so of free practice two sparks flying in the pit lane as Sergio Perez has his intermediates exchanged for a set of mediums so a lot of sparks flying out the front left of that uh, uh, tire uh, as the uh, the tire gun makes contact with the uh, the wheel nuts uh, but uh, no harm done there for Sergio Perez. Okay, I think uh, the Ferrari of Charles Leclerc has joined the intermediate gang. He too has gone out. So has Pierre Gasly, Oscar Piastri. So they're all going to end up doing it, aren't they, really? Uh, with uh, the limited time we have left. Still don't see, from our view at least, any rain coming down. But certainly, very windy out there. 40 kph gust. Let's hear what Leclerc is saying. Any issues? No. It's not for it is. It's not rage. Understood. Well, I feel like we could have we could have told him that. <laughs> that. That sounded a little bit like a Brazil 2022 moment, didn't it? Yeah. When they sent him out on which way round was it? They sent him out on. They sent, they him, sent him out on Inters when inters. it was dry. At yes, the start of the and session, it wasn't ready. And it completely wrecked his session. And it sounds like they've done the same thing again. But surely they, they know it's not ready. They're doing it as they we just have discussed to, to take know. the shine off. I, I, I agree they have to know, but it, it just didn't sound like it, did it? <laughs> <laughs> that was the tone of Leclerc's voice then was quite similar or quite reminiscent to me anyway of the tone he used in Brazil. Well, when I he was he heard that tone quite a lot. He was exactly clearly was over there. Ferrari's strategy team completely, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, well, well, we do see a couple of drops I think we're on our get screen. The rain. I think we're going to get it. Yeah, the fans out in front of us across the straight are getting their ponchos out, their ponchos. Their, their cagoules. Uh, Rosanna, we're seeing spots on uh, the camera angles that we've been given. Uh, and the, 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 the fans in front of us from the commentary box are starting to put on, as Oliver says, their ponchos. Have you got your cagoule ready? Do you know what? I'm the most unprepared pit lane reporter <laughs> that there ever was. But I'm feeling it's a bit like Monaco again, when it took most of the race for the rain to reach us across the harbour. It doesn't seem to be here in the paddock. It's incredibly gusty, I'll give you that. But no raindrops, and it almost looks from looking... At, oh, hang on, I just felt one. Oh, hang we got one. On. <laughs> or did I spit? Uh, no, I'm looking at the clouds, and I think they are almost sweeping away from the circuit, uh, sort of passing over, although that was another raindrop. That was another raindrop. So we've now got two. Two raindrops don't make a storm. Um, but yes, it's, it's looking quite ominous, I have to say. And people are wrapping up, lots of jackets going on. Uh, but as I said, underprepared. So mine is sitting on the back of my chair in the office. Oh, well, OK, well, let us know when you get a third raindrop and uh, then we'll start. Then we'll start panicking. Uh, the talk about a lack of a storm, certainly one nearly brewing in the pit lane. Lando Norris coming into the pits and then the Alpha Tauri. Once again, it was Nick DeVries pulling out from uh, the Alpha Tauri garage and then just seemingly came to a halt really really jutted and slowed to get that Alpha Tauri moving. Norris not really sure what to do. He had to come to a halt and then moved uh, left into the fast lane to then scoot into his garage. Oh, and there is the rain. the rain. It is absolutely pouring it down in the hairpin. Oscar Piastri makes his way through. He's on the soft compound of tyre, skids out as he makes his way down the main straight. So with five minutes to go then, talk about localised rain. It is coming in from the hairpin. That's turn 10 out of 14 that we have on this track. And it is making its way towards us in the pit lane and the paddock. So that that honestly felt like a film. It's dry everywhere else. And then suddenly the deluge, the rain drops. There were definitely more than three on that occasion. Yeah, and that's why these drivers and teams have a constant communication of you know where the rain is, when it's coming, um, because you know you never want to arrive on slicks, you know, in a big braking zone like that, like that hairpin, uh, and turn ten with a wall of rain like that. Um, you'll just go straight on, no no chance. You'll accelerate, you know, off the track with with slicks. So um, yeah, heads up driving from Oscar to yeah. park the car, come in very slowly. 
No, he did a great job there as uh, the fans of the grandstands definitely are getting their uh, coats and waterproofs on and might well make a dash for it with just under uh, four minutes left. But then Lando Norris in the other McLaren is out there right now. He's on the intermediate tyre. They're coming through into, into three and four. It is dry. Although, as we see on visor camera, riding on board with Lando Norris, there are some drops of rain as he gets closer and closer towards the back end of the circuit through six and seven, the right-hander, which brings you into the first of the DRS stunts. Gets a little bit of a twitch on the steering wheel, and now I think we are getting the rain coming down. The visor is filling up with rain. final sector, just complete downpour. Uh, and he's, uh, he's missed the apex there of, of turn nine, but he's... He's pushing. I mean, he has the enters on. He's getting a feel for what could be coming tomorrow uh, as we expect more rain through the weekend. And yeah, this this corner, the hairpin, turn 10. It's like a swimming look, pool. It's raining sideways. It really is. It, because look at uh, Nando Norris, even on the intermediate, struggling to get the power down on the exit of the hairpin as he now trundles down uh, the back straight. But it really is like a swimming pool. Suddenly, the spray that comes off the back of Lando Norris's McLaren is in full flow as he ro rolls down the gears and he's decided to come into the pit lane at the end of that lap and report back on the conditions he's seen. And now the rain has found its way into the pit lane and on the main straight. So it has been slowly coming. It's heaviest around the hairpin, but it is very much coming and covering the whole circuit. Yeah, I like that decision from Lando Norris and McLaren to go out and um, have have a lap of of running in, in the rain there, or would we say half a lap? Because we don't know when that's going to come again. It could come, you know, during the race, and and that half a lap is going to pay could pay dividends uh, to Lando Norris having that extra experience over the other drivers. With two and a half minutes left to go here, not sure if anyone's going to have another go. No, they'll be uh, the brave if they do. And last thing anyone wants to do is risk any kind of coming together with the walls but uh, everybody has come into the pit lane now as the rain starts to properly hammer it down here in canada uh, we're in uh, on the the man-made island on the notre dame in the saint lawrence river and certainly the water finding the track and uh, hard to see downtown montreal now as a uh, the rain clouds and a little bit of fog high in the sky starts to loom over. And I think it is, as Oliver suggested, very much day done for the majority of our drivers. Lewis Hamilton in the Mercedes will end this session fastest with a 113.7 as he has his headrest removed and uh, starts to get out of his car. But you know who isn't quite done with it yet? Fernando Alonso, of course. Leave it up to him. The wily old fox. He's there at the end of the pit lane. He's stopped. He's on the intermediate tyres to do a practice start. Fires it up. And away he goes. He wants to try out and see what it's like in these conditions. And there's a cheer from the fans as well. 50 seconds on the clock. There were no tracks. Uh, there were no cars on track. But Fernando Alonso has decided, you know what? I'm going to go out there. And uh, I think everyone's very grateful for that. Yeah, cheers from fans who are sticking it out in the torrential downpour. So props to them. Uh, looks like Stroll is out there as well. Here's yeah, his radio. Both Astons. Down in turn 10 is very, very wet, so just take it easy down there. Oh, it's extremely wet. Like, it's it's flooded. And even on the intermediate tyre, coming down into turns eight, Lance Stroll can't turn it into the corner and glides across the runoff and rejoins on the exit of turn nine. Uh, so we are actually seeing a few cars come out now. So both the Aston Martins are out there. Uh, Carlos signed as is Joe Guan Yu in the Alfa Romeo and Lando Norris in the McLaren as well, as we get another look of, La of uh, Lance Stroll, pretty much aquaplaning really, uh, across the, the runoff of turn eight and nine. Uh, Carlos Sainz in the Ferrari is also now into that treacherous final sector. The rain is now covering the whole circuit, but as Oliver mentioned, that final sector, they just can't get it stopped. Carlos Sainz doing the exact same thing as Stroll did just a few moments ago into the breaking of turn eight, just can't get it slowed down, can't turn it in, glides across the runoff and rejoins. And actually, the rain is pouring down so hard, it's quite hard to see the cars coming into shot of our cameras. I mean, this is red flag conditions. If, the, if it wasn't the end of the session already, this would have been called off. And if this was a race or a qualifying session, it would be called off. 
So, I mean, if this is a harbinger of tomorrow, then we could be in for another day of filling, I'm afraid. <laughs> All right, then we better rest up, then have a good dinner tonight. Uh, it is the end of the session, and we can barely see Carlos Sainz's Ferrari as it comes down the back straight. The rain is that thick, but then you look out of our commentary box window, and it is nowhere near as thick. Yes, it's raining, but it is not as anywhere near as heavy as the final sector. And that's, that's only about 400 metres away exactly. from here. Yeah. Yes, it's steep skier. Let's hope I'm planning. And uh, signs then on the radio confirming that, uh, yeah, aquaplaning very much so in that final sector and he decides to come into the pits uh, who else is still left out there i think charles leclerc went out there in his ferrari as did valtteri bottas joe orlando norris uh, too i think joe guanyu was but he's come back in now um so we'll see uh hopefully the uh, last runners come into the pits but that is the end of the session then as the rain came tumbling down a slightly extended by 30 minutes fp2 session due to the lack of running in practice one and it's lewis hamilton who leads a mercedes one two at the end of fp2 with carlos Sainz in third fernando alonso and charles leclerc rounds out the top five verstappen bottas perez stroll gasly the top 10 piastri magnuson norris joe sonoda the top 15 then it's de vries albon ocon sergeant and holkenberg 20th and last what a day of running a very interrupted fp1 session and now rain right at the end of fp2 as well a lot for the teams and drivers to think about uh, and a lot of uh, scary moments there at the very end of fp2 we're all set for what's going to be an interesting weekend here in montreal ahead of the canadian grand prix and from Andrew Benson, Harry Benjamin, uh, Oliver Askew and myself, Rosanna Tennant, uh, we'll be here to talk you through all of that in FP3 and qualifying tomorrow. Who will start on pole position for the Canadian Grand Prix? Might it be a row in Lance Stroll? What about the Mercedes team with these upgrades, potentially giving them a little bit more performance as Lewis Hamilton topped the timesheets? Uh, it's been an interesting one. What, if anything, do we read from today's session, Andrew? Well, do you know what, Rosanna? If, it, if, it, if I thought it was going to be dry tomorrow, I would be putting my hat on Charles Leclerc for pole position. I was, I've was i been really impressed with the Ferraris in that second session, both over one lap, and then more importantly, being able to pretty much match Max Verstappen's Red Bull over a long run. But it doesn't look like it's going to be dry tomorrow. <laughs> so I think it's, it's, I mean, you've got to go for Verstappen, but uh, I think it's, 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 it's wide open with the rain expected for most of tomorrow. And Ollie, as a driver, I mean, to have a lap and a half or so in these wet conditions, if there's more of that to come, they need to get out there fast in FP3 to make sure they are totally up to speed with how this track feels in the cars uh, ahead of the, the Grand Prix on Sunday, don't they? Yeah, certainly plenty of running uh, so far in the dry, but the, the trick is in, in the rain, the, the best drivers in that condition are able to um, learn, learn the quickest. So each each lap, as as I said in our in our broadcast yesterday, each lap is is a different experience, and the track is changing all the time. You know, there's there's uh, more puddles in, in some spaces, some spaces it's uh, evaporating, and um, it's a super tricky uh, part of, of motorsport racing in the rain. And it's also the great equalizer, in my opinion. You know, it gives the, the opportunity for drivers to make a big difference in, in the performance of the race car. Certainly does. And Harry Benjamin, are you going to go home and Google everything there is about this track uh, so that you are ready for any stoppages in FP3 tomorrow? Absolutely. I'm going to have all the stats on the St. Lawrence River, uh, <laughs> Notre Dame, the expo that was held here many years ago. Don't you worry. We're going to have all that ready for the red flags tomorrow. Well, thank you very much. Andrew Benson, Oliver Askew, Harry Benjamin, up in the comments box uh, and Rosanna Tennant me I have been down here in the pit lane it's been a wild Friday we'll be back tomorrow for FP3 and qualifying uh, we hope you can join us then it's been an IMG production for BBC Radio 5 Live